It's been very wet and cool. But of course, plants are loving it after the very dry weather we had three months ago. But I've noticed when I was looking at this end of the tennis court, the new growth on the um, Mexican oak. This second flush of leaves is called Lammas growth. Growth. Lammas tide is um, a point in the Christian calendar which falls on the 1st of August. And very often, especially oaks and other related trees, will produce new growth as a second flush in uh, August, as this Mexican oak is doing. Younger trees exhibit this much more frequently than the older ones, but it makes it very attractive as a second go of colour. Coming to the other end of the tennis court, I noticed that the uh, Japanese tree is now flowering. We've seen this before because of its lovely new growth. But here it is absolutely covered in these rather strange flowers, sort of a central point and some subsidiary flowers around the edge. You'd observe how large these new leaves are. And apparently they were used to wrap food in, in China and Japan, where this tree is native. Coming back from the Malotus, I thought I spied a flower spike on this wild gladiolus. This comes from the Drakensberg Mountains of South Africa, gladiolus flandagoni. It is on cliffs and uh, escarpments, so it likes a well-drained soil. I'm afraid Bertie rather disgraced himself at the groomers this morning when he was discovered to have fleas, first time he's ever had them. And I think we had uh, some visiting farm dogs last week and I blame them. Of course our wonderful dog would never have fleas, quite unheard of. Oh dear, anyway, he was fumigated apparently, which sounds rather drastic. Now, uh, here's a rather jolly Mahonia with its rather jolly flowers. The flowers open from the base and the top of the spikes are still unopened and they go from yellow to a deep wine red. This rejoices in the name of Mahonia Nighton's Cabaret, which in itself sounds quite jolly. I'm very pleased with the flowering on my Hydrangea Aspera from China. I collected many, many years ago. It's flowering really well. And I think it's most attractive. Obviously the bees like it. The true flowers are sort of feathery and a kind of mauvey pink. And the outside not flowers, <laughs> or a whitey pink. The whole thing is very pleasing. 
And I think this is a form which has long details of the leaves. I collected this uh, Wolong in uh, southwest China in the panda reserve. No pandas, just the hydrangeas. I love these wild dahlias. This one from Mexico is a sweet dahlia, single lilac pink. Dahlia murkii. Very pretty. More buds to come. Doesn't form a very big bush disappears completely, of course, in the winter. Coming down the drive, <clears throat> we're confronted by this enormous now and beautiful grass with something lurking behind. Let's have a look. The incessant rain we've had for the last eight weeks and the cool weather for August has meant that the hydrangeas have really come into their own. They love this sort of weather. Here is hydrangea paniculata limelight, formed an enormous bush and it's backed by another enormous grass here, which is called cosmopolitan, Miscanthus cosmopolitan. I think it's got lovely, bold foliage and variegation, which is very pleasing, but it has formed an enormous clump and is due for a sort of slaughtering. Now, in rather contrast to the uh, limelight hydrangea we've just seen, is this rather jewel-like uh, creature, very low growing and small, sort of fading to um, a pink, if you can say fading, aging to pink. This is little lime, it's called, hydrangea little lime. Lovely. Continuing along this bed is this uh, rather miniature paniculator hydrangea, which rejoices in the name Bobo. Yes, quite so. No idea why. But it is quite sweet, I think. Now, just along from Bobo is a very diminutive hydrangea from Japan, Japanese hybrid. And it seems to be very, very small and sparsely flowered. These are quite nice little double flowers. But really, it doesn't make much of an impression, does it? Its name translates as something to do with a waterfall. I'm not entirely sure why exactly. Fighting its way through this vigorous passion flower, I've noticed the bell-like flowers of a climber from South America called Bimaria and I think it bears a little bit of close scrutiny because there's the um, little sort of blue 
spots on the end of the petals and then you look inside sort of yellow and orange and also more little spots but it is having to uh, compete on this wall the purple of Cestrum, Cestrum Crete and purple, another South American. And then the ever expanding yellow Daphne, which I've always known as Wickstromia gemata. It is now Daphne gemata. I think it's just gorgeous with its yellow flowers and its acid green leaves. I thought we could uh, finish by having a look at this border here and see what colour there is in August still. Dahlia, I think this is Dahlia Murdoch, Murdoch, Scottish. The last flowers are clashing somewhat, <clears throat> I'm afraid to say, of the Gloxinia relative Ray Mania from China. This intriguing spotty interior. This one is enjoying being in the well-drained bed here. We go along to Hibiscus Bluebird, one of the most successful of the hibiscuses available and a, a very good doer, plenty of flowers over a period of time in the autumn. In amongst the froth of the Verbena Bampton, we have the bold yellow of the sneezeweed, Helenium canarina, which makes a really good bright statement backed the back by uh, the lobelia laxiflora still got some flowers on it the banana from china china musa lesiocarpa which has yet to flower unfortunately rather submerged in the Perovskia, which I've chopped back rather vigorously and regrettably, it's enjoying itself so much it's crowding everything else out. And here we have another hibiscus called Chiffon. Towards the end, we've got Penstemon, King George, I think that is, and an osteospermum, which remarkably looks a little bit like the rather rare tuberous cosmos from Argentina, cosmos pucidanifolius. So here we've got rarity at the back and commonality in the front. <laughs> 